This conference will now be recorded. Mainly for my own notes, so when I look back at this, preparing for the next one, I'll know what uh, I actually said. All right, we'll go, we'll go ahead and get going. Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming to the, attending the third meeting of the Tampa Bay Habitat Restoration Consortium. We are, again, looking for ways to better collaborate, continue the amazing work that's uh, being done on in habitat restoration uh, within, within the Tampa Bay region, looking for uh, ways to better share, continue to better share lessons learned, um, information that we can provide to uh, within and to and among uh, one another, trying to um, work on potentially uh, pre-permit planning and to understand the understand and track the habitat restoration projects that are going on in the Tampa Bay region. I'm Gary Rollerson, I'm the ecologist for the estuary program. Uh, Ed Sherwood is also on the phone, he's driving, I think he was with the NFL this morning at a, uh, at, a, at a planting on Picnic Island. So um, it's probably soaking wet and trying to get home. But uh, thank you all for coming. Um, we got a pretty packed agenda, so I'll, I'll start moving along on that right now. The first thing, um, at our, at our last, uh, last meeting, we created or finalized a, um, a document for, that uh, helps describe the responsibilities and roles for the members and the uh, and potentially co-chairs and and staff for the uh, for this habitat restoration consortium, and we're at a point where we would like to uh, nominate and elect some co-chairs. Again, this is an ad hoc uh, group, very similar to the uh, technical advisory committee. We advised the tech the TAC, who would then advise the management policy boards on the, on habitat restoration subjects. And um, I, I was thinking, and um, correct me on this if, if, if it doesn't make a whole lot of sense, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about having potentially one chair that is uh, from the private sector, one from the public sector. I'm the staff liaison um, and definitely there is a support role for both the chairs and the, um, and, and the committee as, as a whole. I've had a couple of folks that have stepped forward that are interested in uh, serving. And um, I, I know that Jamie Swindaz from the Water Management District is on. Jamie, would you like to say a couple, say a couple of words, say hello to us, please? Hi, everyone. Um, I, I know many of you and others are, are still new, but I've been with the district since 2008 in various roles. I uh, started actually as a swim intern, so hi, Brant, hi, Lisa. Um, and I have done MFLs uh, within the district as well as working on uh, regulation as an ES and um, as I'd like to say, faking my way through uh, being an engineer at times as well. And so I've, I've been back with SWIM since about 2018, again, as an environmental scientist and uh, just always learning, looking, and growing. So I'd, I'd be honored to be considered for co-chair. Thank you, Jamie. And Thank you. I see that uh, Doug is on with us. Uh, Doug Robeson from ESA. Um, 
basically wrote the last, uh, he and his partner, his colleagues wrote the uh, the last Habitat Master Plan. I think he's been involved with all of them since uh, the, the first one in 1996. Um, it, it was basically, um, I think his brainchild along Tom Rees to create this uh, consortium and he has expressed interest as well. So Doug, would you like to say anything? Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, that's that's right, Gary. I've got a long history with the TBEP master plans, Habitat master plans, and um, uh, yeah, I'd be honored to to serve as a co-chair. I, I think that uh, the, the concept of this committee really started about a decade ago with the with the second uh, master plan update, and you know the the success of the nitrogen management consortium. And what that's been able to do, uh, bringing point source holders together and being kind of the focal point around around the uh, reasonable assurance plan for Tampa Bay. There are many things that this committee can accomplish that uh, are are significant uh, and not you know not just not just uh, get-togethers to talk about things. I think there are some discrete uh, accomplishments accomplishments and monitoring activities and review activities that this committee can accomplish that will serve the community well. So I, I, I would like to see some of that move forward and would be glad to, uh, to help the committee do that. <clears throat> Thank you, Doug. Is there anybody else in this really a gust group that we have have gathered. Thank you all for coming on that, is, that would be interested in serving as co-chair. We don't have any term limits right now, but I'm assuming that we would revisit in probably two to three years to check the comfort level of our co-chairs and um, how, we're, how we're doing it at, at that point. Okay, so um, actually, what for the just to, to just for the record, what I'm going to do is put a link into the uh, into the chat for a, um, a Mentimeter, and I have up the um, I have up the code the. Uh, the the co-chair uh, nom nominees, and if you could, yeah, if you could just go in there and um, you, uh, just for for the record to make sure that we're we've got a reasonable cross selection of folks interested in these these two worthy candidates being our being the chair for the next uh, little while. while. And, the, and I don't know if for y'all, but on mine, the color coding is blue for Doug and pink for Jamie, and that was not on purpose. Um, I will leave that running in the background, but um, thank you, thank you, Jamie and Doug, for volunteering to uh, to help out with this. I'm excited to get it uh, get it running forward, and if, if you'd like to, um, I appreciate it. If you'd like, I can I can hand over the uh, the agenda now to y'all as the as the co-chairs, if you've got it up and running.
or I can do the quick introductions as well. Either way, what the Jamie Doug, what are your preferences? Well, I didn't know um, you were gonna let us run the meeting, so <laughs> So I think uh, I, I wish for you to Yes, uh, sorry, give me uh, one second here. Um, do, do you want us to take over now? <laughs> <laughs> really? I'll go, I'll, go ahead, I'll go ahead and keep it going. That's not a problem. Don't worry. <laughs> we'll get to next time. Okay, so um, we have uh, today's set of, uh, set of presentations. We have uh, three somewhat related it, it just sort of it sort of happened that they're all um along the living shorelines uh, motif uh, first we're going to be hearing from brian cook at university of south florida talking about uh, building ecosystems for resilience um, and randy edwards longtime usf professor and also moat marine laboratory is going to be talking about fishery habitats seawall enhancements and then cj reynolds from the regional planning council will be discussing a, a shoreline policy guide draft that uh, she and the um, one of their committees has been preparing for the last several months. So I will go ahead and start turning turning it over to um, to Brian. Yeah, sounds good. Um, let me see if I need to. I don't know if I can tell which screen you are seeing. Your map flashed up for a second on mine. Um, changes into two chat. Name there. Uh, okay, that should do it, maybe. Yep. Are you seeing the uh, presentation there? We are. Okay, great. And and you said uh, maybe tell me uh, how long do I have? You said maybe about a half hour. Is that too long? Too sh that, that that's, that? About, that's about that's about Brian. Okay, right, Brian. sounds good. Well, I, I really appreciate you guys having me on here and um, participating. I didn't really know about the group before this, and now I want to participate more. Um, and uh, so Gary asked me just to share what work I've been doing recently. Um, I'm at USF and the Florida Center for Community Design and Research. And then I have an office. Let's see here. I have an office, wide open office, and uh, I guess the cat's out of the bag, but um, the big news this week is I'm going to be going to Applied Sciences um, to work with them. So, um, but um, so I'm a landscape architect. Let me see. I'm going to skip ahead here. Uh, well, let's go back. The, the, the title here is Building Back Ecosystems for Resilience. And one of the questions in there is resilience of what, and I'll kind of get around to what I mean by that. But so I'm a landscape architect, but when I went to my schooling for landscape architecture, it was really much more of an ecological basis systems thinking about landscape and the interconnectivity of urban and landscape systems. So that's kind of where I come from. Um, I do typical design work, but um, also sort of planning and um, larger scale thinking um, about the way the interconnectivity between the way we design urban systems and um, and then the coast and uh, part of the reason I really focus on that um, I grew up the, the joke with my family is I was a fish until I met my wife and then we had kids and so um, really have an attachment to the coast and the, the coastal waters so I always think of my excuse of doing inland work as a, or the reason for doing inland work is sort of an excuse to think about how to keep and maintain healthy coastal waters, which is really kind of my interest and passion. So, um, so I'm going to be coming at this from more of an inland uh, landscape systems kind of thinking perspective. Um, but I really do appreciate, um, you know, all of you. I, there's probably much, many more uh, science-oriented and trained people here, and and I really look forward to and appreciate um, the potential for collaborations um, between design and science, which has uh, far too often been separated. So 
Okay, so just recently, um, last year, I did publish a book chapter in a Dutch publication called, uh, the book was Building with Nature Perspectives. And the main topic, so if you want to, you can cue, just put your uh, camera uh, from your phone on there and it'll take you right to the article. But the main character of the story for my article uh, is Eugene Odom, who many consider to be the founding father of uh, kind of ecology, and especially in terms of uh, in, in academics, uh, producing the, the first textbook for ecology, fundamentals of ecology. So what I wrote talks about Eugene Odom and his perspectives, um, and and builds on top of that and kind of goes through an ecosystem perspective and then also relates that to a history of development in Florida. So um, what I'll share with you is sort of, um, you know, I think this writing encapsulated some of my main principles, but then um, there's some projects that can be shared that relate to that. So my guy, Eugene Odom, um, in, in that book, Fundamentals of Ecology, my favorite part is he goes out into this lake and he's talking about the lake as an ecosystem. And this quote, the first time I read it really struck me. So the inseparability of living organisms and non-living environment is at once apparent in the first sample collected, not only is the pond a place where plants and animals live, but plants and animals make the pond what it is. And for me, it's about the inseparability of our landscape systems. So whether they're inland and coastal or whether they're upland and riparian, these things are all intertwined and interconnected. And so, um, yeah, this was sort of the main premise behind uh, what Odom was doing. He mentions this early on in the textbook. And so as his example, he's using the pond and um, what I often share like with my students or when I'm talking about this work is that we often see the pond as like this 2D kind of, uh, or, or like a picture of a pond being this kind of container or circle of water. But Odom would picture a pond more like this. It's like a, a functional system of relationships and that that's what the pond is, is all these things being in there and then interacting on each other. So. Um, and then also how that incorporates uh, humans, right? Like it's not just these ponds acting on their own somewhere else and humans doing their thing, but these things all sort of intertwined and interrelated. And, um, you know, maybe with your guys, with your folks training, some of this is, uh, you, you may have been through some of this, but I just wanted to share it because it really lays a foundation for some of the projects and the way that I, I've been thinking about things and trying to explore work in a region. So, for example, in Ohm's book, he talks about this kind of continuum of succession, um, serial stages, and, and this kind of growth and complexity over time. And that's how we get these sort of unmediated landscapes, right? Um, full of complexity, interrelationships. But there's, there's also, especially in more recent ecosystem thinking, is the understanding that we're not building towards some uh, optimal stage, that there's kind of this back and forth and things are being taken back to different to previous stages, but then sort of with a difference. And so, and how that occurs through situations like fire, taking say a, a prairie back, but then also like mowing in an urban condition. So you end up with systems or landscapes like this that, you know, if they were left to be would be one thing, but then with mowing and people being in, intertwined, they are another. And then there's this idea that uh, the system, if certain inputs are put into that system, they can, like the whole system can completely change into a different thing. So for example, the pond ends up becoming like covered with a whole different kind of plant regime and you know different animals and uh, composition within it because the introduction of, of other things and then the last part is this idea of the uh, the watershed and how things that are far apart can affect each other so these are the main principles um, a systems approach interrelationships developed over time that serial stages 
and in relationships over time that are built, and then indirect impacts. And um, especially thinking about that, relating the urban systems to coast. So like with students, um, we've been, I have them draw these different systems so that we understand um, what they are individually. So like what is a river, what is an estuary coastline, but then also um, how do these things interrelate? So then we discuss that as a class and really try to get this full picture of what the system, what's embedded within the system. And so then thinking about what ecosystems are we actually constructing and that humans are very much intertwined in the constructing of these ecosystems. So this is maybe where it gets a little more fun and you can kind of see where I'm going with this. Um, so if we look at say the mouth of the Hillsborough River, um, there's this old map and uh, at the, you can see where I've highlighted there it has oysters highlighted and in this and uh, the river of the golden ibis, there's this quote, going down a low water, it was no hard task to collect as many oysters as the whole of two companies could consume. Nearly all parts of the coast of Florida furnish these excellent shellfish in inexhaustible quantities. So this is like the foundation of, that, of the system, right? There used to be uh, this kind of landscape that was developed over a long period of time that then afforded the circumstance to have things like oysters and bass like that in the Hillsborough River. So um, there's this kind of foundational th elements, right, landscape components that then allow the situation to have bass like this or oysters that we had at the coast. But then over time, there's an the introduction of new and different things. So like the harvesting of those fish and um, how that starts to, uh, you know, they're, they're, we're still sort of working within that original system. But then as humans start to play a bigger hand at, sort of at this uh, industrial scale, um, the system starts to sort of shift. And rather than being maybe, let's say a geographic based system uh, where all the elements are kind of, that are interrelated and, and acting upon each other are just geographic, these non-geographic components of an ecosystem, so say economics uh, of, of human systems really starts to change the system and, and sort of like that pond turning into, you know, being covered with, uh, with other plants and that um, as nutrient goes in, then the same thing occurs where the system starts to shift. And so, um, what I've started to do is look at this kind of historic understanding of places and the shifts that we've caused in urban developments and how that's impacted um, coastal environments. So when you go from something like this, which was in the late 1800s to something like this, right? Um, not only is it a dramatic change to the ecosystem, but it also shows the incredible aptitude that humans have for constructing systems. Um, we, we have a lot of ability and then, um, and it makes great amount of change and effect. Um, so then there's this quote from Dark and Talamy um, that I kind of fall back to, which is that the species that evolved within an ecosystem are what created that ecosystem over time. So things like the oysters and the fish, but he says, or they say that they cannot be interchanged willy-nilly without destroying the relationships that, did, that drive function in that particular ecosystem. And so this is where, um, you know, I'm kind of thinking at it maybe from a conceptual standpoint. And um, I know it's difficult to, to kind of document a direct cause and effect from such large systems that are say inland to the coast but um, can't help but think that, uh, you know, in, in this kind of ecosystem approach that we can recognize that we are starting to change systems, especially the advent of the Anthropocene and different um, kind of recognitions of the way that humans are impacting our environment, like climate change. But within all this, um, I sort of uh, find hope that in the same capacity that we are able to construct such radical things as these giant islands in the middle of the bay, 
Um, Rebecca Sims in this article says sustainability is socially constructed and that this is one of the greatest strengths as an analytical concept because sustainability encourages us all to consider what we want to sustain and to assess the ways we wish to go about this. So, um, you know, I, I, I kind of have this belief that if we identify the things that uh, we want to make sure are perpetuated, that we, through an ecosystem approach and understanding the foundations of those systems, we can sort of return or uh, go back towards building the foundations of those ecosystems um, and maybe even in new and innovative ways. Um, but I, I think this is sort of the whole idea of restoration, right? To kind of build back things that we had so that the things, the other things that were built upon those systems can continue to thrive and flourish. So for example, we have these great projects like Ulele Springs. And then it becomes this situation where the economic system is actually supporting the geographic system. So for example, in this case, um, by restoring the place, it provides an economic value for development. Um, so the restaurant nearby, the parks, the housing, all of that is enhanced and the value is increased by actually restoring the habitat and making it a healthier place. And this is where I like to work is between these urban and landscape systems and helping to find value and um, for all sides. I love win-win scenarios. And so um, at the backbone of this is uh, one of my favorite authors, William Jordan III, who says, uh, in the long run, the best natural areas will not be those that have been simply been protected from him, human influences, but those that have been in some measure restored through a process that recognizes those human influences and then effectively compensates for them. So for me as a landscape architect, environmental designer, this is the project and um, this is kind of where I like to work is trying to find those opportunities. And especially with the technical expertise by the biologists and uh, environmental engineers and ecologists, but to, to kind of bring that all together with an understanding of urban space um, so that we can basically be building restoration, building habitat through new projects, sort of like what you lately did. So um, types of projects that I'll show you here. What the first little bit is uh, exploration and communication of systems. So I think this is a really important part uh, to kind of get everybody involved so that we can actually understand what we've done to places um, and, and maybe even points of return, like what, what things might we want to go back to or rebuild, reconstruct. So um, this study started uh, with one of the classes I teach is in Bradenton, I had a student that was looking at this area. And so we were looking at through the historic analysis, um, how did urban development impact this area? And so he ended up developing this map. And so everywhere you're seeing that is, um, is sort of the aqua and hatched, those used to be marshes. Um, and then at the edge, there were uh, some shoreline conditions that have also been affected by urban development. So this became like an X-ray of the urban condition, trying to look at the different areas that we could potentially kind of pull back into future development. And so this becomes like a guide for future development uh, to uh, what we may integrate into um, development as we go forward. So continuing on that, um, started looking at the Tampa region and uh, one of my favorite examples like Spanish Town Creek. So, found this old map that shows Spanish Town Creek going through uh, where, you know, that's the north end of Bayshore, kind of right there by the hospital. And it was amazing to find this picture also where it's almost, it's like a canyon that's running through that space. And if you, you know, where this is, um, you know, that would be hard to imagine as a, a topography such as that. But then over time with development um, and people sort of fearing for flood, the, the, Creek uh, gets channelized with a hardened shoreline. And then eventually is declared 
a death trap. It's not that the the creek or that the humans had like put houses in the creek way, but more that the creek was out to get the humans. And uh, this death trap was completely put underground. And you can see it's there's no trace of it. And even today, you can sort of see the outfalls of where that historic waterway would have been. But um, to me, this is a really fantastic opportunity, especially when you consider that this was the part on the map that was located for oysters um, right there at the mouth of Spanish Town Creek. And so, um, yeah, this, this to me, uh, you know, this is kind of like where I think design projects come in. And the way I would, I, I would love to work with this is not to just think, well, we're just going to put oysters back in this spot, but to understand the whole system. Like, first, can we work on Spanish Town Creek? Two, if not, um, what's the salinity levels? Uh, what's the flow? What's like? What are all the conditions that oysters require? And is there a, a way that we can reconstruct those conditions, even if not going back to the original creek? But can we reconstruct the conditions for making oysters in this part of the bay? So that uh, realization sparked a project uh, with students where we took a look at the whole Hillsborough River. And uh, I'm not going to show the whole thing, but basically it goes from Lettuce Lake Park down to the mouth of the river. And we looked at the historic maps and where there were waterways and marsh areas, which are really important, right? In the, in the cleaning of the water and creating the habitat where those big, that those big bass rely on that were in those old photos. And what we found was that um, urban development really, you know, kind of steamrolled right over some of these environments and, and it, there's no trace to be found. And again, it's like the oysters, um, it's not that we need to just kind of scoop out all these houses and dig out the river or the creek, but how can we supply the similar conditions so that by the time the water is getting into the river, it has a similar quality as what it would have if it would have gone through all of that stuff that was there before. So it's kind of interesting. I'll show you a few slides here just re really quickly and you can see the change over time. There's apartment complexes. This one has quite a lot of depressions and waterways. Um, this is a Tampa Catholic, which I think would have been a, is a really amazing opportunity, right? Big campus landscape space, um, that apartment building there. Um, here's another corridor where you can really see, especially on the west side there, that giant pond and its uh, littoral edge shelf, right? Doing all sorts of great, wonderful things to the waters it's passing through that system and then how that really changed so much. And so when you look at the whole system, um, this is just one stretch of it, but these are the marshes uh, from 1938 to 2020. And these are the, the creeks. And it's just this real story of atrophy, right? And I think that the idea is like, when you have your arm in a cast and it atrophies, you don't just let it go, right? You don't let it kind of stay in atrophy and just accept you're never gonna use it again. You go to the gym, right? And you have to work out and you have to build that muscle back up. And I think that's where we're at. And um, that's these are the opportunities I really am hoping to get into with folks like you all to do restoration work. Here's just a few examples. Some of the students went out and found some of those sites. Uh, so you can see what the landscapes become. And I think there's all sorts of opportunities. Um, you know, sometimes it may take a little bit of money. We may need to make bridges or do some kind of edge work or work with homeowners to redo their landscapes. But, um, you know, we're kind of understanding the, that there's more value or that there is value in healthy ecological systems and uh, you know maybe in the long run we can make the cost benefit case. So another landscape uh, that's kind of intertwined in all this that I've been really considering and thinking about and talking to people about are uh, water quality ponds. You know these things are something that are radically transforming our landscapes and uh, but the 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 quality of the littoral shelf and, you know, besides just nutrient reduction and um, water quantity, 
um, we're radically transforming the uh, ecosystem that is embedded within those original watery systems um, as we do urban development. But um, I do think there's opportunity in uh, kind of working with developers and um, and engineers and everybody really, you know, this is going to take a real team effort, but um, I think there's some win-win scenarios involved in this also. Uh, just as an example, through part of my research, I thought I'd share this one as one of my favorite ones is, um, so in 2002, here's a lake. This is the way we're currently developing. And so you can see 2006, they build the road and you can see kind of what the edge of that lake looks like. And then the first house comes in there right in front of the yellow uh, arrows. And you can see what the landscape looks like. But then after they're there for about a year or two, right, they cut their little channel so they can get their kayak into the lake. But then they say, well, I also like looking at the lake. So then the whole thing gets blown away, right, edge to edge. And then over time, they and their neighbors do it because everybody's doing it and it's okay, right? If everybody's doing it, then you can do it. So then you end up seeing the, the, um, the growth, uh, you know, aquatic vegetation growth starting to occur around the edges. And uh, really now, by now it's become turf right up to the coast of this, uh, the shoreline. So I would, you know, I've been, uh, through a project I did, I've been talking with Hillsborough County folks and um, trying to put something in a comprehensive plan to really, sh bad pun, but to shore up the policies about um, pond edge uh, development and what we're able to do. And I would say my suggestions would be to kind of bring it back towards this phase where we're kind of, there's a middle ground between having access, but also making sure there's this, um, that we're keeping the ecosystem function intact. And even another, you know, if we wanted to go even further, we can put that idea of what are our goals, we can put that to action and think about it the same way we do in an estuary condition where we actually build bridges over these important ecosystem landscapes, right? So, um, you know, it's just about how far are you willing to go? Okay, so I'm gonna skip through this one. But what I'll say is that um, I, I am very much interested in thinking about how uh, this becomes like a hybrid activity of generating value and um, productivity and making great things for humans as much as doing restoration work in, um, you know, in landscapes and coastal environments. So one of my favorite types of those is up in Cedar Key. If you've ever been up there and you've seen these, um, so this is a backyard clam farm. So there's trays and trays of baby clams in somebody's backyard and they're pulling water up uh, from the canal and through all those trays. And then while it's doing that, it's dramatically cleaning that water, right? while also producing food and giving somebody a livelihood. And then it's putting that clean water back down into the canal. So it's almost like this living machine that is um, both productive for humans and then also cleaning water um, for uh, you know habitat and, and uh, environmental conditions. And um, I'll say that I've done some other projects more dealing with sea level rise and storm surge and coastal resiliency. And so my secret dream, I'm sorry if any of you live in one of these finger islands, but I, I could sort of imagine if, if the worst prognostications come true and we have six feet of sea level rise, that these things could be like all over these islands, making food, giving people livelihoods, cleaning water, those kinds of things, right? But, you know, just for funsies. Um, so then just what's coming up, um, Randy and I, uh, or sorry, Gary and I um, had submitted to take this approach to Palmetto Beach. Um, this has not been, uh, we haven't got the full grant, but we made it to the second round. But just as an example, the idea is to look at Palmetto Beach and not just um, to put more oysters in the bay, which is a really fantastic project that Tampa Bay Watch is doing, and they're also on our team. But to do this sort of historical approach and understand what salinity levels, what flow, what sediment, what were all the conditions that made this 
habitat um, able to grow certain things in its past? And what has changed over time? What infrastructures have we put in? How have we modified that system into what it is today? And then let's do an analysis on the current system. And then in a sort of ecosystem approach, figure out uh, you know, if, if we really need to reduce salinity levels, like where would be the critical locations to try to do something like that? Uh, if we need to increase flow, then are there certain locations that we can do to, to make more tidal influx or something? So rather than trying to directly make oysters, the idea is to create the conditions for growing oysters, including looking at what's going on in the future. So this is the future plans for that area in the port. Um, one last example that I'm really uh, excited about. Uh, I just, I think this is another great example of hybrid kind of technology working with ecosystems and landscapes is the reclaimed water being used and, but in a sort of passive way, creating new habitats. So this is, uh, oh, somebody should help me. This is, um, I always want to say stallion something, but it's a different horse name, right? Omboyette stallion hammock. It is Stallion Hammock, right. That's a swim so, restoration uh, project. Yeah, right. So I, I love that there's this idea of mechanically cleaning water, right? We have all this gray water, so we're cleaning the water and then using this to passively begin the, the uh, create the conditions for future habitat. And then I think there's other opportunity to consider that same water use maybe to start bringing back things like uh, like our springs, right? Like what's some of these magical things that we have in our region. And we can start thinking about water use to uh, do restoration work with these types of landscapes. So I think in closing here, uh, the, my, you know, my guy uh, here, William Jordan III uh, says, restoration will become the principal outdoor activity of the next century. And the result will be the conversion of nature and its classic forms from an environment into a habitat for human beings. And so for me, this is like a very hopeful, constructive kind of perspective and uh, integrates kind of this design mentality. So that is it. Thank you very much. This is kind of like a mile a minute there. Hopefully I wasn't going too fast, but I'd be willing to take any questions. And um, I would love to hear expertise from you all about how to actually do some of this or what are some of the things I'm missing? Um, you know, I, I have my sort of limited perspective, but I, I think that, um, you know, it's pushing in a good direction. Thank you, Brian. Good stuff. Um, any questions for Brian? Either if, if you've got yourself on mute, go ahead and unmute or put them in the chat. I'll be able to address them. I have a question or comment. Sure. Uh, yes, Brian, I want to first of all, I want to tell you that uh, I too am an acolyte, a uh, disciple of the ecosystem perspective, going back all the way to G.E. Hutchinson through E. Uh, H.T. Odom, his brother Eugene Odom, yeah. and their students. Yeah. And I yeah. think that is a very important perspective that is missing in our analyses and perspective on restoration and protection of our bays and estuaries. And mm -hmm. I give you a little, uh, make a little plug for my upcoming talk at Basis. I will mm -hmm. be discussing that at that time. Oh, and great. I, I would also like to thank you for a, what a perfect segue to my following talk because <laughs> what you have talked about these kinds of impacts uh, long term is exactly what I will be trying to discuss in my talk so thank you yeah fantastic yeah if you look at if you are able to get to that article I kind of go through even a little bit before Odom starting in the early uh, 1900s but Yep, Brian, uh, glad you brought up the, um, you know, the, one of the, the screenshot of the, uh, of the Oyster Habitat suit, Suitability Index when you were talking about the potential project in McKay Bay. And it go, I guess it kind of goes back to your, 
your statement about trying to improve the conditions to make, in, in this case, uh, conducive to oyster restoration, you know, just making sure it's going to be a heavy lift trying to make sure that in a lot of locations the salinities are right, the sediments are right, the fetch is right. So just, um, you know, that's for me a part of what this group is about is to try to, you know, work together to make a lot of improve a lot of those conditions. Mm -hmm. Uh, hey, this is Brian. Um, oh, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry, Jamie. I, I was going to say, Brian, that that was a really good presentation. Um, it's really helpful because a lot of time the restoration projects are done where there's convenient spots, right? Publicly owned land that have been altered and definitely need to be restored. And a lot of money goes into it and they come out really well. Um, but if we could target some of these historic spots, um, I think we'd have as good a result and maybe can get back some of the ecosystem services by improving the water quality and maybe quantity and timing mm -hmm. that was there. You're never going to tear up all those houses and do all that, yeah. but you can do pieces, like you said, those stretches of daylighting of pipes and, 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 and trying to get some more littoral shelves in there. Um, and so this is very useful. I've never seen this until you gave that talk um, for the Tampa Bay uh, Association of Environmental Professionals. So, um, very good information. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. You know, one of the things um, we've been talking about is if we could take the whole stretch of the Hillsborough River, uh, if there were monitoring points, which I think there are along the whole stretch, and find out which areas are getting the most pollution or nutrient influx. Like, where do those levels spike? And even prioritizing certain segments so that we can look at those urban areas first and try to think about what needs to be done. Whether it's restoring a habitat or also maybe there's some other mechanical means or you know capital improvement project that needs to happen to, to fix that segment. Jamie, you Did have you have some, Jamie? Uh, yeah, Brian, I, I just wanted to say it, it was very interesting information that you presented and, you know, maybe we should get together if you were able to come up with some particular locations or ideas, it would be interesting to possibly have a um, brainstorming session and for SWIM to be able to maybe put some things on our radar to start, you know, thinking about future projects if, if there's something that we can work together to to make some improvements out of this. Yeah, I would love to. I've, I've been trying to get City of Tampa to, to go in halvesies with you to do a whole river framework plan. That, like that would river. be very interesting. So looking at all the different tributaries that feed into the river and then look Certainly. at them and prioritize them. But um, yeah, I mean, even if it's baby steps, I think there's probably a few spots that are much easier low-hanging fruit than others. And um, okay. yeah, I would love to work through, workshop through any of this with you guys. So that would be great. Follow up afterwards. Absolutely, yes, please. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Um, thanks, y'all, so much, um, Brian or Jamie. If you need each other's contact information, just let me know. We can kind of share that. Next, we have uh, Randy Edwards. Go ahead and start to switch it over to you, Randy. All right, do you see my uh, first slide? Not yet. Not yet. Oh, I'm trying to share it here from my... Okay. Perhaps this will do it. Does this do it? No? Nope. Uh, what I'm doing is from my Adobe full screen, like we practiced the other day, I thought that I would be showing my slide. It's not exactly the one that I have on, uh, that you have been sent, but uh, uh, if anybody has any clues, how I, what I have, what I'm not doing right here, was my first go to meeting. Hey, so, Randy, when I did mine, I had to go under, um, where there's uh, the, all the tabs and it says audio, screen, and webcam. Oh, okay. Yes, yes, And you yes, go okay. on screen, and then there was a spot to say, start sharing my screen, and then I could, I could locate the file, and that worked well. 
Oh, uh, oh, I do that and go to meeting first. Okay. Yeah. Oh, sorry about this. Uh, but all right, we'll we'll go back here to the. Uh, all right. I don't see that. Uh, do you do you want to start mine from what you have, Gary? I'll have to uh, deal with the uh, slight modifications. I'll go ahead and drive. No worries. All right. You had it up for a second. Oh, hang on. Here we go. All right. So the title of my presentation is Fishery Habitat Enhancement of Seawall Environments. I'm kind of looking at the other end of the ecosystem, the final points of the ecosystem. And uh, just by way of background, let you know that I have about at least 40 years of experience in looking at fish habitats, particularly interested in juvenile fish habitats, which are so essential. 35 years in the Tampa Bay region. And uh, let me start by saying that I have no self professional financial interest in anything. I am retired. I'm not looking for grant funding. I'm not looking for another publication. Nothing except my concern and care for the environment. And I don't know how many presenters you ever get to hear that can say that. Very few. So anyway, next slide. I changed the title to It's in Our Hands. By that, I mean that there are things that we can do, that we can make significant impacts by doing. <clears throat> and therefore, what I want to do is to convey to you what I have learned in the field over these years. Now understand that a lot of it has not been published because this kind of work was very hard to get funding for. And it's not the kind of stuff you, can, you can't you can publish natural history, observational type of work in journals much these days. So you're gonna have to take my word for it, but I'm hoping that uh, it will you'll understand. So next slide, please. However, in the... Uh, Oh, that one, see, there went the wrong one. We'll just have to do it without that slide. I had inserted a slide of basis two, where I presented a study, was one of the first uh, swim projects funded, where I did assessment of fishery habitat in the Manatee River uh, estuary subsystem of Tampa Bay, in which I was able to identify the habitats that were important for early juvenile fish in that particularly snook, redfish, and, and to some degree spotted sea trout and other species that I showed in my first slides. Uh, so that was done in 1991. That was presented in basis number two. You can see what basis are we up to now? I don't know, but anyway, it's been a long time. But that's some of the perspective that I had. Uh, ne next slide, I hope. Oh no, leave that slide, leave that slide, okay. About the same time, I was uh, awarded a early action project by the Sarasota Bay National Estuary Program to, to do what we call seawall enhancement or what use what we call seawall reefs, artificial reefs. And in that project, uh, we, I, I say we, but basically I did the work. I did the design, I did the field work, I did the underwater fish counts and everything. But what was done in that project was to select a series of, of canals that were seawalled and install artificial habitats. There were four different module designs in four replicate canals. And after we, after we installed those, we gave it time for the epifaunal and epifloral community to develop on the structures, went in and I did the underwater fish counts using a hooker rig. I spent hours underwater counting fish. Well, this was the, this was the framework for action report this, that, uh, that uh, reports some of the first findings, but the results were awesome. That's the best word I can use for it. On average, there were over 200 fish on those artificial habitats. Whereas I had control transects, 30 meters of bare seawall, and during that entire time, I did not count a single fish. So it was obviously a high potential. Unfortunately, uh, well, let me just let me show you a little bit more. Next slide, please. 
And there, there were the details. Next slide after that, I just described it. This is the, uh, the, the study site. This is called Country Club Shores. It's on the far south end of Longboat Key. This was when it was installed, created in 19, in the early 1960s. Bay Bottom was pumped up to make these finger fill canals and to create a uh, golf course in the background, as you see. And the bottom slide shows the uh, uh, completed uh, much later uh, view of the aerial view of the, of the uh, subdivision. Next slide. And this is this is the Google Maps view of it. But I want you to notice is that uh, there there uh, a tremendous alteration that was done. A little deep channel was dug into a very rich seagrass bed. It, this was a a, ebb, a flood tide delta there. And on the far right, you'll see an area of natural habitat. That's a quick point uh, preserve that was owned by the. Uh, by the county or by the city of Longbow Key, I'm not sure which, that was we've recently restored and I was involved in. But you can see what the habitat would have been prior to all that destruction. Next slide, please. This is just what I did uh, uh, on, on Google Earth. I measured the, the miles of seawall. There in that one small subdivision, 10 miles of seawall available for for enhancement. Next slide, please. I'm not going to be able to get into the details of the design, but we selected the one design that was the, seemed to be the, the best because it, it was um, it, it had the most fish and it was had the best uh, construction techniques that were more feasible and least expensive. And in general, it was a wedge-shaped design along the seawall, made out of uh, PVC piping some standard fitting, some things we had to do differently, but it was generally, the, the morphology of it was, it was, it was height of the uh, structure was to the mean low water line. The distance out was four, four thirds the times that height. And the length along the, along the seawall was at least two times the distance out. Next slide, please. Uh, this is again a, just a cartoon of of, uh, of that structure, but the point is that at that time there was some some potential resistance from DEP about uh, permitting it because of uh, uh, impacts to to boating. Well, that design, if you take a typical outboard uh, boat. A Mako 22 foot would show you that by doing that kind of wedge shaped design, you avoid any impact to boating. The boat could go right along the seawall with its gunnels brushing the seawall and it will not impact it on low tide. If it was tide was uh, lower, it was prop would be hitting bottom. So anyway, we did that. Next slide. And if necessary, next slide. Uh, you could even modify the shape to that to, con to a kind of a concave shape. Now, recently I've gotten back involved with the Sarasota Bay NAP and I'm trying to uh, trying to instill interest in this again. Uh, but there have been some suggestions of resistance because of the issue of plastics and microplastics. So I was pretty much put off for that because my design was based on uh, inexpensive PVC materials. However, just recently I've done I've done search on the internet and found that there are studies available that show that PVC does not degrade in seawater, and therefore it is a suitable material. And there are there are several articles to that extent, and this could be further researched. Next slide. There is another another alternative that I've kind of exciting alternative that I that I have come up with recently. Uh, this is a what they call bio rock. It's a uh, it's a technique that's being used by by an organization called the Coral Reef Alliance to, to create artificial coral reefs. Next slide, please. Biorock is formed by electrolytic dip deposition of calcium carbonate and magnesium carbonate, very much like the materials that are found in corals and, and uh, mollusks and barnacles and shell forming organisms. And it is done by applying a negative voltage 
to the the iron structure typically you can think of rebar and a, a nearby anode with very low current very low voltage you could you could make this happen what you're seeing is the evolution of hydrogen bubbles from the electrolytic process and that carbonate for, uh, is formed on it and <clears throat> you could do this with a 12 volt car battery charger that's the level of uh, electrical power that's required required next uh, slide please this is an example of after a period of time you can develop very large carbonate structures and this would be an option for creating a very similar structure that i uh, had originally envisioned with uh, using the pvc structures but this is all to be determined they call it bio rock cement or secrete next slide please this is a view of longboat key the bay bayfront park on longboat key uh, on sarasota bayside uh, I've been in touch trying to mediate and try to to help uh, perhaps get one of these, uh, a couple of these bio rock types of uh, structures put in as a demonstration part, uh, project at this park because the city of the, the town of Longboat Key had a major sewage spill of its uh, sewage main across the Sarasota Bay a couple of years ago. And they are now having to do mitigation in uh, to offset that uh, impact. And they are working with the FWC. They actually have plans that they have been reviewing to uh, put in the various types of mitigation law in this park, planting uh, mangroves, uh, other kinds of uh, structural things. And so I have tried to coordinate this with the with the BioRock folks and the FWC. But the problem with, with doing these things, if you're going to do it legally, you have to have permits. And nobody knows what the permits and requirements are. It's just it's just like a catch-22. But hopefully, uh, I'm hoping that the the, the uh, town of Longboat Key and and uh, Bio Rock could could uh, manage to put this in. Next slide, please. This uh, this slide just goes back to tell you where my interest came from. You see this little red dot? That's Pompano Beach, Florida, where I grew up as about a 10 year old, 11 year old boy. So see all those canals, all those seawalls. I saw those when they were natural environments. They were they were mangroves. This was there was a, the creek there alongside. It was called Cypress Creek, and there were majestic big cypresses there. It was all natural. And along the linear uh, intercoastal waterway, you see was mangroves, extensive mangroves. And during the time I was there, and for my ten years between the time I got there and to graduating high school, those were all destroyed, turned into these canals. So the thing is that the importance of this is that not only were so what was uh, are the, was there so much destruction of natural habitat, but there did now is the opportunity to do things along large areas of seawalls. Next slide, please. And this is just Broward County in general, and it extends all up and down Broward County. It extends into Palm Beach County and and uh, Dade County the same. Next slide. Getting back to Tampa Bay, where we are. Next slide. Here we're looking at the Pinellas area of Tampa Bay, Boca Ciega Bay area. Uh, I remember reading when I was in first in graduate school a, an article by <clears throat> Bill Odom, who was the son of Eugene Odom. He wrote an article in 1970 on the insidious destruction of the estuary. And the, the uh, model for that was Boca Ciega Bay. Next slide. There are opportunities throughout Tampa Bay. This is the Northern Tampa Bay, Old Tampa Bay. This is town and country. Next slide. West side of Tampa Bay, uh, Venetian Isles, huge numbers of canals, miles of seawalls. Next slide, please. Apollo Beach on the other side of Tampa Bay. Again, miles and miles of, of seawalls. Next slide, please. And only a couple of miles from where I live on the on the Manatee River, a similar kind of a, a finger fill canals environment. All these have potential for restoration. Next slide, please. It's not just in Tampa Bay. All the NEP, NEPs have huge areas of these kinds of finger filled seawalled canal systems. This is Charlotte Harbor. Next slide. Indian River Lagoon. It's Cocoa Beach over here on the left, and look at the extent of canals, finger-filled 
sea walled canals that are, provide a huge opportunity for restoration and habitat enhancement. Next slide. Getting back to Sarasota Bay, uh, where my project was, you can see way up in the top left, you see the little part where my original project was, and you see that there, zoom in please with the next slide. You can see this on the upper left was where the project that I did uh, 30 years ago. You see all these other areas of seawall. You see in the central part, you see Bird Key that was really created by pumped up from the bay seawalled canals. And then in the bottom, you see Siesta Key, which has a nine mile canal that was dredged out in the 60s with one outlet to the bay. And I'll talk about that later because they are doing some things there that need to be, uh, be understood. Next slide, please. This is a slide from 1986. And it turns out it was a slide by a project by my friend and colleague and dearly departed Robin, uh, Robin Lewis. Many of you who have worked in habitat restoration knew Robin. Back in 1986, about the time I started in this area, the concept of habitat restoration was to was to to uh, grade down the land adjoining a waterway to the proper elevations and plant mangroves in those elevations that Robin had uh, figured out were would support uh, healthy mangrove populations. Next slide, please. And this is what you would get within a year or two mangroves growing that. This was a project in Broward County, but I want to point out this was kind of the naive kind of restoration and it still remains today and why is I say it's naive because if you've done field work as I have done if you took a seine and you drug it along the edges of those mangroves then or when they became mature during say the late early fall when juvenile snook required to use of habitats you would be lucky to collect one juvenile snook along those mangroves it's not the habitat that they use not the habitat that they require I'll explain why shortly. But if you had certain habitat features designed into that would be easy to implement, you could produce one of the structural habitats like I've discovered found numerous times on the Manatee River in which you could, in a two meter stretch, you could collect maybe 100 snook, 50 wren drum in the, uh, in the uh, spring. You can enhance that habitat. When you do this kind of linear monotone, tonic planting of vegetation, whether it's mangrove or marsh grasses, you're not creating, you're not enhancing habitat, you're enhancing mangroves. That's what you're enhancing. If you really want to enhance habitat, you have to go into the next level of detail. These opportunities are too few, they're too expensive to, just, to make average natural habitat. The idea is not for things to be natural, but to have them be optimally productive natural. And that's what I'm kind of promoting here today. Next slide, please. Uh, just go through this slide, the next slide, and next slide. And what the point of this is that very often the public and even the, the public elected officials and decision makers see things like certain kinds of habitat restoration uh, as being a silver bullet that will, that will solve and the problems. But for so often these silver bullets not only just fall short, but they turn back in ways that are destructive. And that way that they are destructive is what I experienced when I was doing fishery habitat uh, enhanced uh, stocking in my early days of my career for the first eight or nine years. I found that the fishermen who were so eager to protect snook and redfish in their habitats that they knew were required suddenly lost interest in habitat. We're going to stock them. We don't need to worry. We can now build more subdivisions. My company will make more money now because we're going to build more subdivisions. I'm going to have more business in my carpet store, I was told. And that's what the silver bullet, when it comes back, can do. Next slide. Next slide. OK, now in order to make habitats optimally productive and predict per, per, uh, in particular, for juvenile fish, because juvenile fish are the component of the ecosystem that are dependent on these kinds of habitats. Adult fish 
can utilize all types of habitats. But if you cannot produce juvenile fish, you won't produce adult fish. It's called the year class effect. And we know scientifically in fishery science that production of fisheries, the annual recruitment to a stock is dependent on survival of either larval or early juvenile stages. And those habitats that have been lost so extensively in Florida are those that, uh, that have been, are those that used to provide those habitats and that are now so limiting. But anyway, the attributes, you have to understand what, what those habitats have to be like. And first of all, is they provide refuge from predation. Young fish are so susceptible to being preyed upon by larger fish. Uh, the, uh, you, you also, sometimes they produce some surface area that provides trophic augmentation. Things grow on them. There's a food web that develops. Structural diversity is important because it has to provide habitat ref, uh, refuge for all ages and all sizes. And tidal availability for refuge at all tidal levels is important. See, that's what happens in those linear mangroves. They look good when the tide is high and the water is up in the mangroves. But when the tide is down or when it's, you know, it's a full moon and the tide is low, the little juvenile snook redfish, they're in that deep water and they are prey. They aren't being enhanced. And, and also, finally, another important thing is benthic connectivity, because some things that people are doing these days uh, do not have benthic connectivity. Most of the important fish species require the, the orient to the sediments, not midwater. Next slide, please. Uh, there are several approaches that are being promoted and implemented today, and I have to discuss them because they sometimes are seen as alternatives to what I was suggesting in these seawall habitat uh, reefs. One is reef balls. If you look at a reef ball, first of all, you see it, it's a sphere. What is the, uh, what, if you would take a material and make the lowest surface area possible, you put it into a sphere. So it's surface area uh, limited. And then it's got these few openings of a certain few range of sizes to, into one cavernous, cav cavernous interior. Now there are certain fish that'll utilize their during certain, at certain sizes, certain, sta certain stages of their life. But in general, these young of the year fish that need habitat will not utilize those. When I was uh, working at the, uh, at USF in St. Pete and the US Geological Survey, I frequently took my lunch out to the seawall behind the USF library, sat there on the seawall, and there's a string of reef balls out there. And I've sat there day after day, hour after hour, and rarely saw any fish. Occasionally see a sheep's head kind of grazing on some barnacles. You might see some mullets swim around, circle them, but you see very little. They do not provide the kind of habitat that, uh, that we <clears throat> need. And also, they're not really practical because you can't deploy any size of a reef ball, they do make small ones, but even the small ones could have that impact on navigation. So you would really, they do not do what, what I'm suggesting needs to be done. Next slide, please. This is another thing that's done by the uh, Reef Ball Foundation. Re by the way, Reef Ball Foundation is a 5013C corporation. Everybody thinks, well, that's, that's a that's a nonprofit, it's an altruistic organization. Well, if you you should know better. If you don't think about it, 5013C merely says that you cannot make plow back the profits into the corporation. And you can have, but you do have salaries, you do have fringe benefits that the, the executives and the staff obtain. So they have financial interest. So they're not without financial interest. Anyway, this is one that what Reef Ball calls Reef Wrap. You see that? Reef, I call it Reef Crap, but uh, excuse me. Uh, but you see these little mini Reef Balls, they'll, cast onto this piece of uh, concrete that they put alongside the, the seawall at the Green Bridge in Palmetto. And I went out there one day, I walked the entire length of that seawall to the bridge and did not see a single fish. At that time, the tide was, uh, was going out and there were only a few inches of water. Uh, but that's why there were, and also you'll notice that, uh, that adjoining this, uh, this so-called reef raft structure, there's an extensive, shallow, barren uh, sand flat. And so what does that mean? This does not provide habitat. Uh, I, I want you to just imagine with me for a minute. I'm going to read this. 
uh, under, to understand why this installation was not providing his fish habitat, I want you to imagine with me that you are a post-larval redfish or red drum. Your mother had spawned you about three weeks ago during the full moon about a mile off Egmont Key. For the next few weeks, you enjoyed the productivity and food supply from the outflow of Tampa Bay. You, su you survived, grew, and thrived, but you felt your body beginning to change from the larval form to the post-larval form in which your morphology was beginning to look like, more like a tiny red drum. Over the last few days, you rode the incoming tide into Tampa Bay. And yesterday, you found the mouth of the Manatee River and you felt your body changing and you know that you must find a habitat if you are to survive, find a juvenile habitat, somewhere where you will be safe from predation and with ample supply of prey. If you do not, if you do, in about six years, you may find yourself off Egmont spawning alongside your mother and hopefully producing more redfish. The urge to find a nursery habitat is so strong. So today, as you swim up the river, you encounter the palmetto reef wrap structure. It does have some structural complexity that would help you avoid predation. So you make the plunge. You settle to the bottom at the structure and your body completes its metamorphosis. You are now a tiny red drum. For the next few days, all is good and you feel yourself getting larger and stronger and surviving. However, a week after you arrive, the next full moon comes along and along with it comes to higher and lower tides. And as the tide goes out today, there's no longer any water covering the reef wrap. So you have no choice, but you swim out over the open sand flat and you are no longer a red drum. You have been eaten by a hardhead catfish. You haven't, there has been no enhancement. And that's what kinds of considerations have to be made in these habitat restoration projects in general. Next slide. Uh, another uh, technique that's being uh, implemented, employed, and promoted in Tampa Bay is these vertical oyster gardens. They don't, uh, they can have a little bit of help, but when you consider the amount of oysters that are on the seawalls, if oysters grow well, they, they grow well, uh, grow in that environment, they grow into pilings, and so a few strings of oysters are going to have minimal impact. Maybe if you've installed many, they would have some, but they're intertidal. They have not, they do not have that benthic connectivity and they do not, uh, they are not really provide much habitat for juvenile and small fish. Next slide. There's another thing that's really being widely employed right now and promoted is called mini reefs by, uh, what is it, that company called uh, Ocean, uh, uh, I don't know, I can't remember, uh, yeah, Ocean Habitats. If you look at one of these on a dock, are plates of polyurethane uh, uh, and that uh, are connected with the uh, PVC pipes, and they provide very little diversity of structural habits. Maybe some fish could use those spaces in between those plates at a certain size and so forth, but they don't provide much habitat. Next slide. In preparation for these kinds of talks, I, I visited the Mar Vista restaurant on Sarasota Bay where this company has put in a demonstration of these kinds of uh, mini reefs. And uh, to me, they aesthetically were <laughs> ugly. I mean, let's put it no other way. And I spent probably 20, 30 minutes there observing it and I did not see a single fish. It's probably because of that, that connectivity. Next slide. Uh, there's a big project underway in Sarasota, a big project, an initiative, shall we say, a group of uh, residents of this Grand Canal, this nine mile long uh, maze of canals into Sarasota Bay have been promoting these mini reef habitats, They're raising money to install them in, in the Grand Canal. Well, this Grand Canal has been there for you know, what, how many years now? We're talking about 60 years practically, uh, has one outlet and they have serious water quality problems. Uh, the water is aesthetically not pleasing, and I'm sure it's not very productive in terms of uh, fish rehabitat and so forth. But these people are collecting money to install these these uh, mini reefs in this uh, in this system. Next slide. Hey Randy, um, I can't remember how far we are in the slides right now, but we need to wrap it up pretty quick. Okay. 
All right, just, just I'm going to zoom through them. All right, zoom, next slide. Next slide. What happens with those many reefs is they, they, they cause eutrophication to increase. Those organisms produce tremendous amounts of feces and pseudofeces from what they, what they consume of the phytoplankton, but it's accumulating in the sediments and the amount of water that they filter, I've done the calculations, can produce minimal filtration effects. The water quality cannot, even if every, every uh, homeowner had one of these things, there would not be a, hardly a noticeable thing, noticeable change in the water quality. And that's primarily because phytoplankton has a doubling time of a half a day to one day. Next slide. I think I'm about through here. And so the problem with this is this could be a silver bullet that these, these people, these well-intentioned residents are implementing, but the, uh, the can turn around, next slide, and shoot them where the sun don't shine. By that, I mean in the bottom of those murky canals that the sun doesn't even reach. Next slide, this is, I'm summarizing here. So here's my vision. I think because there is such an extensive opportunity, there are probably over a thousand miles of seawalls in southern, uh, in southern uh, Florida, over a hundred miles in Tampa Bay, close to a hundred miles in uh, Sarasota Bay and so forth probably several hundred miles of seawalls in the NEP areas. I, my vision is that there should be a collaboration between the, the uh, Tampa Bay, Sarasota Bay, Charlotte Harbor, and, and Indian River Lagoon estuary programs and get together and write up a plan for a pilot project, a large pilot project uh, that they could submit to US EPA. This is right up their alley. They, if they could get funding for a tidal creek study, they could get funding for, for a habitat restoration study on seawalls. Uh, they should also include DEP and uh, FWC. Uh, the, this project would, would install large numbers of these structures and would scientifically monitor, evaluate, and permit uh, and, and develop permitting requirements, refine the, the, the designs and materials, develop criteria for further implementation and then that way then a public and private implementation implementation can begin and be done without having to deal with what i call sometimes fly by night organizations that are only looking to to uh, make a profit and really have no real understanding of their impact of their of their products and then finally i say if this product project is done we, of course, would never present it as a silver bullet, as any habitat restoration project should ever be presented as a silver bullet. We have to always keep the public informed that this is only one of the kinds of things that needs to be done. Thank you. Thank you, Randy. Um, like to take any questions or comments? And that was the end. <laughs> I got a question for Randy. Yes. Randy, did, did you like uh, Gus Munich's uh, reef, reefs, seawall reefs that he was constructing and installing? I'm, try, I'm trying to remember what they were. Refresh my memory. I remember the name. Uh, Gus Munich, uh, he he was installing uh, reefs out of like chicken wire and rebar oh, yeah. and oh, yeah, other yeah. people. I don't know if he put PVC or not, but but uh, he seemed to have some really good success with that. I remember that, yes, yes. Yeah, he was the oyster man or something, yes. Uh, you know, they had some of the same kinds of uh, attributes to positive things, such as this, a lot of structural uh, structural uh, complexity, but I didn't think the uh, the chicken wire, you know, wasn't going to last long, and uh, just throwing them in the seawalls as they were, it was a kind of a, a step in the right direction, but it wasn't bad, but it wasn't, I don't see that kind of throwing junk in the water uh, is going to do it. You have to have, have to be much more a, a planned, uh, engineered approach. Anybody else? Hey, Gary. Yes, sir. Hi, right, Doug Robeson here. Randy, that was a pretty, pretty good presentation. Thank you very much for that. Um, I've got a couple of comments. Uh, one is uh, you showed where you grew up on the East Coast, 
and all of the finger fill canal dredge and fill uh, mania that occurred in Florida post, mostly post World War II. Um, and the destruction was you know, really just just massive. And I, you know, I don't know if it's ever been completely quantified, but you know, one thing we do know, this is part of the last uh, Habitat Master Plan update was, you know, what what are the what have been the changes in tidal wetland communities since 1990? And there's been, frankly, very little change. I mean, one or two percent. You know, and and in some cases, positive gains, which we would like to attribute mostly to habitat restoration work, like you're describing here, publicly funded projects, and maybe some mitigation. But I think um, you know anyone that is a detractor of regulations can compare, you know, what you showed and the kind of destruction that took place. And then the post 1990 era, and it's just night and day. It's just so you know the the, the picture is is catastrophic. You're right. Uh, it does create tremendous opportunities for restoration, and I think that's one of the reasons we wanted to to start a committee like this is to to talk about uh, how do we look at the really big picture and then zoom back into what's feasible and realistic. I think focusing on urban seawalls is a great idea. Like you said, there's thousands of miles of them. And there are, you know, lots of different approaches to doing that. Um, I, I wouldn't besmirch the private sector for trying to be creative and come up with ideas. I, I think because they're making a profit doesn't make it bad, but um, but they do need to be to be vetted with real science. And and I, I would hope that what we would do in this committee is is come to some consensus on what are what are the best designs for some of these opportunities like urban seawalls. So, yeah, that's much my comment, and thank you for the presentation. Yeah, and I apologize for having to kind of gloss through everything. And there was so much there, some of which does was general in terms of uh, habitat uh, restor restoration and enhancement. But yes, uh, I, that's what what I would like to see, and perhaps this committee could at least have some some uh, effect on is to uh, push this concept forward. I think this, uh, all the NEPs working together could come up with this kind of a scientific approach. And uh, a couple of things I didn't get to, uh, didn't get to mention is this could be implemented so easily if we have a well-designed, scientifically evaluated uh, product the people that live along those canals where I installed my sea moss, they loved them. They came out when I was doing my fish counts and told me how great they were and how they loved having them and all the fish and things that they were seeing there and how their neighbors were asking if uh, we, I was at Moat Marine Lab time, could come and install them at their neighbors' places. They were willing to pay for them. And that, so the potential is great. And uh, but at that time, we had no wherewithal. Most of us would not support that kind of thing. And so uh, I went on to other things. But but yes, I think this Habitat Committee, if you could do a little bit to just get this on the larger agenda of Tampa Bay NEP and the other NEPs, I think it, it would would be a good help. Thank you. Jeff, um... Jeff Field just shared in the in the chat a link to a um, a living shoreline review paper. So thank you thank you for that. I know there's several people on the call that have been involved. You know, you know Tom Tom Reeves at the top of the list in, involved in constructing living shorelines over the past decade plus now, and we're I think starting to see some really good research come in on it. Um, some some of that information that you're asking about, Randy, it's it's in the brand it's in new stages or it's coming around the corner. Uh, there was a question from actually both Stacy Day and Jamie Swindaz um, about those PVC wedges you're talking about. Did they have anything else on them? Uh, no, they were made of PVC pipe, jointed together with a lot of members at various angles. We just came up with what we could do quickly and easily and inexpensively, and it, it, it did serve the purpose. What it had was a high diversity of structural diversity in within those spaces that fish of various species, various sizes would utilize. 
fish cannot have to have a, a, a habitat that protects them from predation, and that has to have a certain size, certain features to it. And with regard to the living shorelines, that's what I, one thing I was trying to add to this talk was that it's so easy if you if you understand and look at the the uh, restoration or enhancement that you're constructing in terms of a living shore, if you look at it from the perspective of the fish habitat, which is not very often done, you can increase the effectiveness and productivity by many times, tens of times, and be a hundred of times. I see these products, uh, I, I see, uh, uh, but I've seen the, the, the Robinson Preserve in Manatee County, and it's beautiful looking. But if you are a fish, it's deadly. There is no structure. It's bowl-shaped uh, habitats of marsh and mangroves that when the tide is low, a fish will not survive. It would be so easy to take a, a, a piece of equipment and, and create little uh, deeper spots, little uh, invaginations in the shoreline. So for the kinds of things you see in natural habitats that are so productive, but that it's not being done. So that's the point of that is you can do so much more with very little more. Thank you, Randy. I know the, the people on the on the call are definitely proponents of the the habitat mosaic approach, which is yeah. like a large part of what you're go, you're you're approaching. Really appreciate the talk. I'm gonna turn it over now to uh, C.J. Reynolds from the Regional Planning Council to talk about the uh, Re uh, Brazilian shoreline policy guide that they've been working on. Thank you, Gary, for inviting me to present today, and I really uh, gained some important uh, knowledge from the previous speakers, uh, Brian and, and Randy, so thank you for that. Uh, I felt like I was at a master class on uh, shoreline considerations, so I'm going to be very quick with you all on this. I wanted to give you an update of a new initiative, well, actually something we've been working on for several years here uh, at the Regional Planning Council, which uh, has involved some of the folks on the call today uh, from the local governments, the estuary program, as well as uh, a staff on that. So in the interest of time, I'm going to blaze through this, but you'll have the material uh, that um, the presentation. So functionally, we had a grant to uh, create a policy guide and model language, which would really help the region, local governments participating in the coalition to support the adoption of best practices for uh, creating and maintaining both uh, living shorelines, enhanced shorelines, and also addressing uh, seawalls and bulkheads to really achieve resilience. So we were funded by a grant from DEP in the Florida Resilient Coastlines Program. It was a super rapid uh, project. Uh, and we have a series of goals to develop a document that will define recommendations for establishing a hierarchy of shoreline policies uh, that support uh, habitat preservation and restoration. Uh, significantly, the need to establish uniform heights for bulkheads and seawalls and addressing uh, sea level rise and tidal flooding up to 2070, and also um, work to begin and support coordinated installation, maintenance, repairs, and, and a variety of things. I heard permitting mentioned as some challenges previously. I've heard that over and over again in different uh, contexts. And then uh, guidance language that would help local governments to avoid the negative impacts um, liability. And, and in this context, we're not just talking about public shorelines, but privately owned. Uh, and so that this would include uh, an appendix, a document that would provide model language uh, recommendations for comp plans, but specifically looking at code, which is really significant. So um, we have substantial uh, brains on the team. Uh, Tom Rees is, on, is a member of the uh, program helping us put this together, and Erin Deedy, who is uh, an attorney with extensive public policy expertise on climate and coastal impacts, has done a lot of work in the southeast with different um, uh, local governments, such as Broward and Monroe County. Uh, the, the grant was intended to get a lot of input, and it is really just a, a midpoint of some of the work that we've been doing. We're going to continue to uh, revised this. This most recently we presented recommendations and just had major discussions on Friday last week. So uh, Damon Moore is also on this call. I saw today He's, he lived through Friday. Um, so we we have made some major progress. A lot of this I just recognize the team, which also includes Kara Sarah, who's in our office and working with me on that. The um, a lot of work that the initial work was built on 
some key goals uh, provided by the uh, TBEP in the Critical Conservation Management Plan. Um, a lot of the work that uh, uh, TBRPC and uh, TBEP did in the past two years, looking at a crosswalk on the policy goals and how were the estuary program goals being uh, aligned with local government comp plans and other initiatives without initiated there. Our overall goal is really this large resilience component, which recognizes uh, the changing sea levels and tidally influenced flooding and to provide both community flood protection benefits and ensure the ecological integrity of coastal habitats and shorelines on bay waters and riverine systems. And this was sort of very carefully crafted by the uh, Resilient Shorelines and Open Spaces work group, which uh, Gary was really an instrumental um, co-lead and, and helping us uh, define some critical topics several uh, several years ago, it was 2019 to 2020. Uh, the working group developed these draft principles, uh, which I think you find very um, functionally supportive of some of the missions we were just talking about was to begin to articulate very clearly um, how we should begin to look at shoreline development and redevelopment, restoration, et cetera. And so that natural shorelines are the preferred option. And going through and recognizing uh, how this uh, plays out from a variety of different aspects of what are the capacities of seawalls, um, that we need uniform heights, that we need to consider, uh, biophysical characteristics, uh, looking at um, elevation issues, and it just it's a great, great overview that I really have a, uh, the work group put a lot of thinking into this sort of brief that led to this, which um, in the very tangible level led us to produce a sort of recommendation to establish a uniform height for seawalls um, and that the, what they're going to look at. Now, this is being updated. I just wanted to show you that. And most recently we had uh, the first workshop for this project uh, was at the end of June to give an overview and really talk a lot about some of the bigger issues that we're facing and give an overview of the guide. Um, and then most recently we did this workshop, which we went through about more deep details on what is in the ordinance and what we're attempting to do. I'm gonna just say at this because I know we're, we're short for time, but we very much want to engage uh, the consortium through a, an effective process or TBEPs, various committees, uh, for those of you who serve on the different tacks and things along those lines, to help us review the language. And more significantly, the bigger picture is going to require uh, very clear uh, construction and design standards, pictures, and components to the point where I had not, um, not being somebody with a biological background, I had not really considered the significance of what are we talking about with habitats related to species of juvenile fish. So how does this all need to come together? Very important. So the purpose of the ordinance is really going to be that we're, we, and, and there's 31 local governments involved in the Resilience Coalition, uh, as far north as uh, Citrus and in Sarasota County, Longboat Key, uh, and the city of Sarasota. So we, we actually span two of the estuaries now at this point, but creating these consistent policies, um, defining these standards for what we're referring to as tidal flood barriers, and then beginning to forward um, define how we're going to do these things. So the concept of the policy and the future ordinance is that we'll be focusing on the components of when existing shorelines, you're either putting in, uh, they have needs for substantial repair due to some sort of circumstances. So um, either new things when they get built or substantial repair will then trigger uh, a sort of set of criteria and standards that then uh, are consistently applied. Um, and that then enable us to begin to maintain this across a variety of cities, counties, uh, and working with the private property owners. So um, there's some components, and, and a lot of this is very, you know, sounds like very detailed legal uh, terminology, and it really is. And this is where we're, we're trying to help local governments define what are the most significant things that they can do to protect uh, and support the community from a resiliency perspective, but doing it in a way. So there's some um, innovative approaches and also very tried and true things that are built into this. Um, as we have conducted, or um, Aaron has conducted a massive analysis of CWA and shoreline policies throughout the state, um, the state of Washington, 
Um, others such as Virginia, which have um, stronger state level policies supporting living shorelines. So we've, we've done a big look at these things. So um, the ordinance, so I'm not gonna focus on this, but you can see that it covers all forms of shoreline um, structures and, and materials. And it's not just seawalls, it's not just living shorelines, but it's really to take stock of how we're going to integrate the concept of multi-use and even within that particular shoreline, you may have multiple devices components involved in that. So um, we'll work to uh, address some of these other things we talked about, permits. Um, there's ways that we need to look at how can we make permitting, the permitting process in and of itself uh, more streamlined. And that's been an ongoing conversation. So some of our follow-up meetings will be to uh, talk with the permitting staff, look at things that the Nature Conservancy and Janet Bowman are also working on a very, um, there's another group that's just dealing with the permitting for living shorelines. So how to address aspects of fill, which are extremely complicated and to begin to st standard, standardize components or when you need a variance or you want a variance, we know what we're asking for as opposed to a variety of ad hoc things that are left. So um, one of the big discussions the group had was to really talk about sea level rise scenarios. And I won't drag you through all of that because it's not your role here in the group, but I wanted you to see how we began to reflect on um, what are some of the components of understanding sea level rise and using a risk-based approach to selecting the scenarios. So I will walk them through a discussion about what is the operational time frame of a shoreline. So when we think about a, net, a lifespan of a natural shoreline, uh, or a man-made shoreline, and how do these different timeframes need to be considering different aspects of um, what is just behind the actual water edge. So um, there's a lot of um, faculty or a lot of information being developed on these things in different areas that we're trying to bring together. So we also encourage the thinking about when we talk about flexibility of a decision, and this is a risk-based thing. So if you've got to make a decision that needs to last you 50 years, it's not really flexible. But if you have something where you can build in intermediate steps or other things, this is flexibility. So we went through this whole component and then I shared uh, the sea level rise and tidal flooding scenarios for consideration. Um, and the group uh, voted went through a poll to have the majority uh, at this point selected NOAA intermediate as the sea level rise scenario. I think quite frankly that, um, or intermediate high, excuse me, for the sea level rise scenario and looking at 2070 as the time frame. And I think this was really based on um, the desire to have consistency and alignment to the state of Florida's vulnerability assessments and processes. Uh, previously, prior to the state setting uh, these new uh, parameters, the working group had recommended NOAA high in 2060, based on the fact that we there was a set of discussions looking at a lifespan of seawalls lasting approximately 40 to 50 years. And this also, I think, will have some considerations as we go forward. So in this case, you can see the red circles around um, 3.5 and then adding on the NOAA high tide flood and ending up with just slightly more than five feet um, in terms of sea level rise, which is also consistent with um, Pinellas County has already set that and several of the cities in Pinellas County. Um, other areas on the East Coast uh, doing slightly higher numbers and different time frames, but seems like everyone is starting to net out around uh, 2070. So I wanted to share that with you. So these were the questions we posed. Um, one of the things that we realized was that people need more information and education on the fact that seawalls are not really built to protect you from storm surge. And there was a sort of perception that, well, they should, and therefore we should add more height to that. So uh, we are um, going to compile the information to provide some general uh, parameters of existing categories of storm and storm surge heights based on certain locations, just to help people understand that um, even something as simple or, or as, as low impact as a category one, you know, adds enormous amount of uh, additional height on top of that, which may not be really feasible or appropriate for any given location. So the big information we went into, which I think was really exciting, and, and we'll look for more get guidance from you all on, um, and it's also, I'm happy to um, have any questions because uh, Tom's a, a, a part of this, was that we work to provide an overview of a new concept for establishing a uniform way of approaching shoreline 
um, hierarchy. So as we talked about the fact that we wanted to establish this clear preference, well, how do we do this on a consistent way from city to city, county to county? Um, so we wanted to make it easy for private property owners. So one of the concepts that we are considering right now is this uh, use of a uh, a flexible strategy known as a zoning, overlay zoning that allows uh, local governments to encourage or discourage certain types of development in certain areas. An overlay zone is defined as a sort of, a, it gets mapped over um, something that's an over, superimposed over an established uh, zone that you may have. And the parcel in that overlay zone is sub subjected to the two sets of zoning requirements, the base level uh, or underlying and the overlying one. So we think that um, our idea is to um, create the concept or a framework for local governments to create resilient shoreline overlay districts. And these have been applied in a variety of applications around the country uh, for ver various reasons. And um, from protecting shorelines to instituting new development ideas. So the idea of this, I'm gonna skip, there's a, quite a lot of um, legal background on this, but the, the component is that we wanted to be able to say, we're going to um, collaborate to, everyone will map and define what you have today but what is it that we want to achieve in the future going forward? And so if we have the overlay zone by creating these mapping concepts, we also then need to create classifications for potential shorelines and their standards and what we want to achieve. And if it's okay with you, Tom, I'm gonna run through your slides and sort of just butcher this. <laughs> and then you can answer any of the questions from the folks. So um, we, Tom gave this great presentation on over this and we talked about the need to establish these classifications and site conditions, um, which really need to be developed. And a lot of the background went into Tom and I and others really taking a look at the existing uh, shoreline uh, assessment tools that are out there to understand that and uh, Tom really with my pressure consolidated and we brainstormed the idea about bringing this down into a set of categories and classifications that would make it easy for local governments to apply it but with detailed subcategories uh, and so after his review and an analysis of the um, NOAA environmental sensitivity index the fish and wildlife, living shoreline suitability model, which have many, many layers of classifications and categories, and also the TBAP map, we started to have conversations about how could we bin these together? Um, skipping these nice pictures, great examples. And, and so the recommendations that we um, discussed and proposed to the group on Friday, which doesn't mean that it's like final and official by any means, uh, was that we, think that we can come down and create three primary classifications and that they we wanted to be able to make this easy uh, for the public and the private owners to understand. And these are the categories and it's it was quite a lot of conversation about the terminology um, like, well, you know, natural, but maybe the beaches themselves aren't natural. Uh, what do we mean by hybrid and armored? You know, so there's some, I would say, nuances that would have to be determined to make this functional. Um, and that just clearly each of these key categories is going to have to have detailed subclassifications and criteria in each of these. Um, the idea being that um, there's uh, technical distinctions and classifications we have to sort of arm, um, hammer out as we go forward. So um, I'll hit this again. Tom addressed the variety of important physical considerations that uh, have to go into uh, creating these categories. Let's see, well, I would add a uh, life cycle of fish to this important physical categories now that we need to expand on that. Thank you. Um, and then what we also talked about was like, before you can apply these zones and these categories that you're going to need to map your shoreline current conditions and then go forward from there. So using the tools and, and the many data layers, um, as, as Tom sort of you know identified what you have available, what you can do and how that can be done. And this was helpful. I think we had a number of uh, engineering and consulting firms on the call in addition to local governments um, and some of the university folks on there. So um, Tom also gave them an example of a project that um, I believe this is an ESA project, correct? 
and that was developed to look at two different examples of um, and now, Tom, I'm just butchering it, so I, I apologize, but uh, a phenomenal example of how the different energies um, and different components of the shoreline could result in two distinctive overlay designations, and what you could allow to be built going forward. So here's his technical review and comparison of the two shorelines, which I'm, I'm sure will make a lot of sense to you once you read through this. This was using the NOAA sen Environmental Sensitivity Index um, and, and showing an example of how we can start to think about these things. Um, a perfect example of uh, differences of you know what was done in the past and how naturalizing it or correcting it for optimal things has made improvements to it. Um, and then we had a final discussion on this piece of it. Um, these are the big things we also identified through our project, some additional needs um, that we would like to see um, these tools updated and enhanced. Um, one of them is regarding NOAA to update the maps, uh, fish and wildlife to expand the geospatial and pot potentially update their maps because the shorelines are constantly changing. Um, that we could put, apply for grants both locally and collaboratively as a region. Um, and then there is, um, we, we met with the um, Army Corps and they're very interested in getting, um, they encouraged us to apply for a technical planning assistance to states grant to do, for them to do a study of the region in a project that they had done previously similar to the Broward County. So I think that I see a potential for uh, the Regional Planning Council to engage the estuary program, our coalition partners, uh, many of you all in the expertise to define what would we want to see the goals and outcomes of a potential core uh, assessment be. I'm not sure how big the spatial footprint is. So, uh, when they did this, they only did it for Broward County. We have six uh, or seven counties, depending on if you look at council or coalition. So, uh, that was it. Um, Gary, you can stop sharing uh, my screen and um, we're basically wanted to give you this quick update of that. So, thank you, CJ. Um, any questions for CJ at the at the moment? I I have one. I I was in on the conversation the other day, but maybe the, this is a better forum for my comment. So, um, you know, I think there's so much. Uh, consideration of sea level rise and storm surge but I don't know for me lately and, and maybe this can be validated by the group but I'm, I'm almost more concerned about water quality than any of those other things and so in that uh, in the development of the shorelines policy guide how much prioritization or what kind of attributes can be embedded you know, besides just, I don't know, like to what strength can you put in this kind of restoration concept to, to, to kind of maintain or develop our ecosystems um, I, I, as we go forward? There's, I mean, water quality has always been important. It continues to, sh you know, show when we don't take care of it, the other issues. This is first and foremost a resilience oriented initiative to climate threats because so separating it from previous natural enhancements and water quality trying to help coordinate that but again the hierarchy and preferences of shorelines is clear softened to hardened and then defining where things can be undone brian is really the most significant component to it so when i i, I wrote a big note to myself what to do about canals what are we going to say about canals that are shallow canals that are narrow um how do we you know what what are the capacities we have so we need to take stock of existing conditions and figure out how we can make improvements that are resilience driven for the ecosystem and the flood protection behind it. So I would see water quality benefits as a natural function of the right kind of plants and, and systems in the right places, right? So that's how I see it all fitting together, but um, yeah. Good. Yes, so I have, uh, I thank you for mentioning fish habitat, but uh, uh, it's not just fish habitat, it's Really, it's a matter of ecosystem diversity. When I saw that slide of that project with the riprap with a little bit of marsh plants behind it, it just makes me give, gives me the willies. 
because that is exactly what should not be done. It, it, with just a little bit of, of design and planning and details in terms of making a complex shoreline could provide habitat, not just for fish, but for wading birds, for oysters, for crabs, everything. But well, what, Randy, um, what I'll say that, that project is, is again part of that habitat mosaic. That was a very limited location that could. Okay. Um, but, could but I'll say it. And right, and I've heard right, heard. right next to it is an intertidal habitat restoration project. So you're not seeing the whole picture with that one photograph. Well, I appreciate that. It's good to, to hear that. But even within that, there's no reason why that couldn't have been designed, that stretch of riprap. And this term habitat mosaic, I know Brandt has used this a lot for the last. Uh, but, 40 years, and it can be good. It can be. It is. It is good, but it is not the solution. If you have a mosaic, and you make that mosaic out of rectangular pieces, compared to a highly irregular mosaic, I'm talking like a tile mosaic or glass mosaic. It's a lot of difference in terms of having complexal complexity in that in that mosaic, and that's what I'm talking about. Yes, uh, you should have mo you should have a mosaic for different habitat attributes for different components of the ecosystem, but you need to also design that structural complexity into each piece of that mosaic, and that's my that's what I am preaching. <laughs> thank you. I I think these are uh, I th thank you for your points on that and your clarification and, and you know in the interest of time I always have to oversimplify things um, certainly what we would like to see is um, a much more detailed collaboration on ecological design there's a lot of great manuals that are out there um, but what we're going to need to do is bring these things home to our region, to our habitats. So if you think that there are certain areas of certain communities that can support certain kinds of habitat, ecosystem benefits, diversity for different species, this is what we need to know. So that is what the private contractors need to be able to follow the recipe, the cookbook, right? So we need to have these really things that are very clearly defined. Um, so it's not um, impossible for the private property owners who want to do things correctly um, to do them. So that's what we're looking forward to is the next step with uh, working with the scientists, the landscape engineers, the architects, and, and all kinds of other uh, seawall construction folks to help uh, revolutionize our business of resilience and making our community shorelines, both public and private, more resilient. So Gary, thanks for the time. And I look forward to, uh, I know Alana's uh, a member of this. So if we can figure out a, a path forward for specific engagement um, workshops, review processes, we welcome that, um, particularly in the very near future. So we um, can work in parallel where it's appropriate. So thank you for your time today. Thanks for everyone listening in. Uh, feel free at CJ Reynolds at TBRPC. You can send me emails for additional recommendations. Thank you, CJ. Is there um, somewhere on the RPC website that, the, that there'll be an opportunity for commenting when the, when it gets to the, I guess, the December draft level? Uh, I'm going to send you documents sooner. We're going to force you to help us review it. So we want to not wait until it's public. Um, I would say probably in November we're going to have some draft, but it's when I look at this thing, it's like, you know, here's the design for the Porsche, but we first need the design and instruction manual for the engine, for the in engine, and then the other special things that go inside it. So I see a whole set of additional documents that are going to be needed to support everything we're talking about. So I'm even interested in mapping that out with um, the environmental ecology gurus um, that we work with. We'll, we'll make sure that the... Um... Gary? Those requests are out there when the when the uh, when we do our our e our tacky blasts and a lot of these folks are are cross uh, cross involved. Okay, thank you so much. I appreciate the time today. Gary, this is this is Ed. Can you hear me? Yes, Ed. Hey. Hey, just uh, for some of the last points that were discussed in terms of like diversity goals and stuff like that. It seems like with the overlay district concept. That's something that could be tailored to specific locations or niche environments where these overlay districts can have different benchmarks or, you know, ecological diversity goals um, through, through the process that's being outlined through the, through the, the working group. So um, I think this habitat restoration consortium is, is, is key.
key to making those points and interjecting when those opportunities where we can involve the full community of both scientists, engineers, and homeowners on deciding what the ultimate goals of, you know, shoreline restoration in particular areas can, can look like. And, and from that standpoint, that's when diversity metrics can start being interjected in the comments. Okay, thank you. Much appreciated. All right, we are at the two hour mark. Thank you so much for your attention and attendance and questions. Thank you to Brian, Randy, and CJ for the for the presentations. Good stuff to digest. I've got a, a, just a couple of quick announcements. Uh, Basis ANAP is October 18th through 22nd. We are planning an in-person component, but there will be a virtual option as well. Um, at the, at our next meeting is December the 8th, and um, right right now we uh, in the in the estuary program office we're finalizing one of our federal habitat restoration reports called the Government Performance Results Act, and I would be uh, interested in sharing those in, that information. It's basically FY21 habitat restoration that's been conducted in the Tampa Bay region. You know, right up this uh, this group's alley is one of the one of the um, one of our uh, reasons for being is to review that, making sure making sure that we're hitting the targets and goals for the habitat master plan. Also, right now we are wrapping up um, an oyster rest a two-year oyster restoration monitoring project, and I'd um, probably offer some folks from the uh, from FWRI to present on that. And then just a couple of brief announcements: uh, Restore America's estuaries. That's uh, it's uh, scheduled for 2022, December 4 through 8 in New Orleans. Hopefully they're doing okay right now. Um, I haven't heard any, any, I don't think that, I think it's far enough out that any issues would be resolved. And also there's a, there's a really interesting uh, land, uh, land conservation uh, marine report card that I, I just saw presented um, a couple of days ago. And it's, uh, I've got the link there in the, in the agenda. Um, just talk, uh, an, another way to view the, uh, the habitats that are out there. But I'll open it up right now for any further uh, discussion or announcements. All right, hearing none, uh, looking forward to, see, to seeing and talking to y'all on December 8th for the next meeting. Um, I've got a list of the 2022 dates down at the bottom. Uh, those are, are not set in stone, but uh, thank you uh, again, thank you very much. Jamie and Doug, if you could uh, stay around for a couple of minutes just to have a quick chat. And everybody take care. Thank you so much. Thanks all. Thank you. Hey, Gary. Hey, Dan. Thank you for, oh, I'll go ahead and stop.